Hello, viewers. This is Dr. B.K. for you, who is going to speak on one more topic on the upper limb. So today, we are going to discuss with a very, very interesting topic in the upper limb, that is the facial spaces of the palm. Now, basically, what are these facial spaces? And what is the importance of these facial spaces? Why do we have to have a knowledge about these facial spaces is they are mainly potential spaces lined by fascia. So, that means they are not dead spaces. They are very much active. Okay? It is a existing life space where some collection of pus or fluid or blood can actually take place. And because of that, what happens is it might give rise to some complications. Now, it is actually present in the hollow of the palm. That is why it is called as the facial spaces of palm or palm are spaces. It is not only present in the hollow of the palm, it is also present opposite to your distal phalanx. Okay, so that is the end part of your digits. So, to be tell it as roughly, it is present opposite the tip of your fingers. So, there is also a very much potential spaces. So, the especially with respect to the palm, it is present deep to the palmar aponeurosis. So, it is not only present deep to the palmar aponeurosis, then deep to that you have the tendons, the long flexor tendons and lumbricals. So, more deeper, in a more deeper plane, it is present. So, it is present in front of the metacarpals and the muscles taking origin from the metacarpals and the fascia covering them. So, between this and deep to the long flexor tendons, digital vessels and nerves, you have these spaces. So, these spaces, it cannot be explored or cannot be demonstrated as such, but these spaces, only we come to know its existence when it is filled by some fluid material. Now, so basically, knowledge of these spaces is essential to know the spread of infection. So, if at all, if there is an infection in any part of your hand, the knowledge of these spaces is necessary because mostly pus tends to collect in these spaces and from these spaces, from there on, the pus can point out or it can spread to the neighboring areas from one space to the other space. Okay, so that is why this is necessary. Knowledge of this, like how the lymphatics we have learned in the breast, and knowledge of the axillary lymph nodes is essentially to know the spread up of cancer or metastasis. So, in the same way, knowledge of these spaces is necessary. So, once you have a very good knowledge of these spaces, then we can go for surgical drainage of pus. So, coming to the palmar spaces, first you see the palmar aponeurosis. You know it is a flattened tendon and it is the most uh, superficial structure. So, it is present deep to the superficial fascia and it divides into four slips and all those things. Now, if you look at from the medial border or the ulnar border, then from the radial border or ulnar, radial border or the lateral border, it sends two septa deep to get attached to the metacarpal bones. Thereby, it is dividing this space in the hollow of the palm into three spaces. Okay. So, from the medial border attaches to the fifth metacarpal, from the lateral border attaches to the third metacarpal. Okay. So, thereby, you have the central palmar space or mid palmar space. Then, you have one more space which is the thenar space. These two are very important. And of course, here also there is a very small space, but not much potential as such of this uh, the thenar and the mid palmar space. 
that is the hypothenar space. Okay. So here I am able to see the Bama aponeurosis, which is sending fibrous septa laterally and medially, which is getting attached to the third metacarpal and the fifth metacarpal. That by dividing the spaces into three or dividing your palm into three compartments, mid palmar or central palmar, hypothenar, and the sorry thena and the hypothenar space. So, a topographical representation of the spaces you are able to see here. The central palmar space you see here. Then you are able to see the thena space. Whereas hypothena space is not much present, but instead of that, you see something called as ulnar bursa and one more projecting here on top. One more space is shown here is a radial bursa. So, what is ulnar bursa and radial bursa? We will see at the later stages of the lecture. So, in the palm, when you have three spaces: thena space, central palmar space, and Hypothenar space. Of these three, main are the thenar space and the central palmar space. So, a better understanding of the disposition of these spaces, so that is where actually they are situated, and what are the extensions of these space. A cross section of the hand will make our understanding much easier. So this is your anterior or the palmar aspect, and that is the dorsal aspect of your hand. Covered by skin, deep to skin, superficial fascia filled with abundant fat. You are able to see here. In the deep fascia, mainly what you see here, this white color line is the palmar aponeurosis. If you look at the palmar aponeurosis, laterally it blends. With the deep fascia over the thenar muscles, and here deep fascia over the hypothenar muscles. Now, it gives two extensions. You are able to see it is called as the medial palmar septum. Okay, that is actually called as the medial palmar septum, and one more septum is here lateral palmar septum. Okay, we have the lateral palmar septum. There is the intermediate one is somewhat oblique. The medial palmar septum extends downwards, attaching to the fifth metacarpal bone, whereas the intermediate septum passing obliquely and getting attached to the third metacarpal bone. So these are the tendons: flexor digitorum superficialis, flexor digitorum profundus of the second, third, uh, and the fourth digit, four tendons. Okay. So this is third, fourth, and fifth. This is the second one for the index finger. This is for the middle ring and the little finger. So superficialis and profundus tendon. This is flexor pollis is longest tendon and synovial sheath surrounding it. We have a separate synovial sheath surrounding the flexor pollis is longest tendon. This is your thenar group of muscles. This is hypothenar group of muscles. Bipinnate dorsal intrashe, one, two, three, and four dorsal intrashe. These muscles are the palmar intrashe. Transversely oriented is the adductor pollicis. Okay. In between these long tendons, you see the digital vessels, that is the arteries and veins, and that is the space for you, thenar space, and this is the central or mid palmar space. Very. Narrow hypothenar space you are able to observe here. So posteriorly, mostly you are able to see skin and fat. Then you are able to see the dorsal vessels and nerves and tendons of extensor tendons. Okay, the long extensor tendons, extensor digitorum, extensor digiti, minimi extensor indices. So those tendons you can see posteriorly. So that is the general arrangement of structures in the cross section of the palm. If you look at the mid palmar space, it is very roughly triangular in space. Anteriorly, you have the palmar aponeurosis and long flexor tendons of the third, fourth, and fifth digit. 
So that is the Candana flexa digitorum superficialis and Candana flexa digitorum profundus. Then you also have the lumbrical muscles which is going to originate from these ones. So mainly the third and the fourth lumbricals, bipinnate muscles. Third and fourth lumbricals are bipinnates which will be arising on the sides of the flexa digitorum profundus tendons. Behind what you see is the third, fourth and fifth metacarpal bones. Then the dorsal intrasia, third and fourth intrasia. Okay. And sometimes the transverse set of adductor policies also forms the posterior relation. So anteriorly third, fourth lumbricals and tendons for the third, fourth and fifth digits, long flexor tendons. Behind three, four, five metacarpals and third and fourth dorsal intrasia covering in it. Okay. Medially, what you see is the medial fibrous septum. So, that is the palma septum or medial fibrous septum which is present here. And laterally, what you see is the oblique septum. See here, it is actually obliquely disposed, uh, running from the palma aponeurosis to the third metacarpal bone. So, laterally, what you see is the oblique septum. So, the contents mainly in this space or the mid palma space. Superficial palmar arch. So, deep to the palmar aponeurosis, definitely of the superficial palmar arch. Tendons of the third, fourth, and fifth fingers, three, four, and five fingers. Then lumbricals, second, third, and fourth lumbricals will come here. Third and fourth will be here. Second lumbrical will be here. Then digital vessels you are able to see and digital nerves of the medium three and a half fingers. Okay. So, sparing the thumb and the lateral side of index finger. The other digital nerves are present in the central palm or space. So here you are able to see the disposition of the central palm or space. Okay. So this space it is present between the flexor and downs. You are able to see here flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus. Now, if you look at these spaces, distally they are actually continuous with the fascia over the lumbrical canals. So, you have 1, 2, 3, 4 lumbricals, they are present inside the facial canals. Okay. So, naturally they are continuous with the lumbrical canals which are actually passing through the web space. So, near to the web space, they are very closely or intimately related to the web space. So that means what happens is any infections from the central palmar space can reach your digits mainly through the spatial canals. That is one way. Sometimes infections from your fingers also what happens due to gravity or sometimes it might track down to your central palmar space. Now, if at all there is an infection in the palma space, central palma space, it can be drained by making the incision here over the web space of the third and fourth and fourth and fifth digits. So, in the web space, a surgical incision can be given and pus can be drained. So, you can give a certain incision at this level or you can open this lumbrical canals and drain the pus from the central palma space. The next uh, space which we are going to discuss is the thenar space. So here you are able to see another potential space which you see here is the thenar space. So anteriorly you see the thenar group of muscles. You know what are the thenar muscles? Abductor pollicis brevis, opponent's pollicis, flexor pollicis brevis. Okay. Then you have the tendon for the index finger. Index finger tendana, flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus. Then you have the first lumbrical and sometimes even the second lumbrical. Okay. Now, 15 percent of the subjects, what happens is sometimes this intermediate oblique septum might be deficient. Okay. And so, what happens is Infections from the thenar space can easily spread to the central palma space or vice versa. That is in the reverse direction also. The spread of infection can take place if this septum is incomplete. 
Okay, so anteriorly the thin arm muscles you are able to see end of the index finger and lumbrical first and second lumbrical fascia covering the transverse end of adductor pollicis forms the posterior limit and more posteriorly are the first dorsal interosseous muscle. So laterally you will have a septum here. Which is called as the lateral palmar septum, and medially what you have is the oblique or the intermediate septum. So this space, the thin arm space, we are able to see it is somewhat triangular, and it is present lateral to the mid palmar space. So this is the mid palmar space, and this is actually your thin arm space. Okay. So an imaginary or schematic representation of the space which is seen here. Immediately present anterior to the transverse end of adductor pollicis and the first dorsal interosseum. So contents of this thin arm space, you are going to have the tendon of flexor pollicis longus. Okay, tendon of flexor pollicis longus, then tendon to the index finger, flexor digitorum profundus, and superficialis, first lumbrical muscle. Then you are able to see concerned with this the fingers thumb and the lateral side of index finger the digital vessels so mostly the branches from the radial artery okay branches from the radial artery and this is branches from the median artery especially the lateral ramen from the lateral ramen they are going to supply so the digital vessels are now concerned with the thumb and the lateral part of the index finger passes. Through this thin arm space, so that is the topographical representation of the thin arm space for you. So you are able to see the tendon of the index finger, first lumbrical. You are able to see here flexor pollicis longus tendon. Here you are able to see and more posteriorly we have the dorsal interosseum, first dorsal interosseum. Now if you look distal, the space is continuous along with the first and second lumbrical canals. Between the interdigital clefts, first and the second interdigital clefts. So naturally, infection of this inner space can be drained by incision in the web space of the first interdigital cleft. So here, mainly, they are given where all the site of abscess formation, pulp space. Mostly here, we will come to pulp space later. So, thin arm space, this place, what happens will be very much swollen. Central palmar space, it will be more here. Now, incisions for this, you are able to see here in the web space for the thin arm space will be given here. For the forearm spaces, the incision on the lateral side, same way for the pulp space infection fingers. The incisions are actually given laterally. So, site of incisions are all actually given in the red color for you. So, mainly for the thin arm space, incision is actually given on the first or second interdigital clefts to drain the pus. Now, next coming to the hypothin arm space, we have already seen in the last uh, picture a very narrow space present medial to the medial septum of palmar aponeurosis which contains hypothenar muscles lined by fascia this is clinically insignificant because it is not very much a potential space as compared to the tenar space and the central palmar space so we will quickly move on to the okay. so here we are able to see a very narrow space that is the hypothenar space for you between the medial septum and the fascia covering the hypothenar muscles. Next, very important space is the pulp space of fingers. Okay, so here you are able to see the distal phalanx. So this space is present anterior or in front of the distal phalanx. It is actually a closed space. Okay, it is closed on all sides. It is distant to the fibrous flexor sheath. So fibrous flexor sheath attaches only to the base of the distal phalanx. 
the boundaries in front you have the skin and behind you see the distal phalanx the space is actually divided into numerous compartments the fibrous septa running and dividing it into numerous compartments from the deep the skin to the phalanx you see these are the fibrous septa and in these compartments it is the space is not loose because these compartments are tightly filled with fat and your digital arteries passes through these compartments so blood vessels to the distal phalanx is going to pass through this space so here you are able to see this shaded area is a pulse space of the finger distal phalanx is actually present here skin from the skin to the periosteum you have fibrous septa divide the space into numerous compartments but these compartments as you see in this diagram it is not empty it is filled with loculated fat so slightly packed space and running traversing through this space is the artery to the distal phalanx okay mainly to the shaft and the, the lowermost end of the distal phalanx now if you look at the digital artery supply the proximal or the base of the distal phalanx it lies outside the pulp space the branch which is supplying the base of the distal phalanx you are able to see it lies outside the pulp space so this digital branch does not pass through this septum okay so it's safe whereas these branches to the distal four fifth of this distal phalanx passes through this pulp space the proximal part does not pass through this fibrous septa through the pulp space but branches to the distal part four fifth of the distal phalanx passes through this fibrous septa and the pulp space so when this space gets infected it is called as whitlow so infection of this pulp space is actually called as the whitlow severe pain throbbing pain severe pain why the severe pain is because the pus gets collected there is collection of pus but there is no space for expansion why because there are fibrous septa and in the gaps between the fibrous septa you have filled with the fat so naturally the space is unyielding the pus is trying to expand but the fibrous septa and the fat is not giving space so that is why what happens is you have a very severe pain in the infection of this pulp space now if you want to give an incision what happens is you give a lateral incision so on the sides and drain the pus you are not supposed to give incision here or somewhere so mostly laterally or laterally laterally or near to the dorsal side laterally you give an incision you and then drain the pus okay now otherwise what happens is if you are not going to drain the pus from the lateral incision somewhere here instead you give a in the front then you might cut these digital arteries okay so to avoid that only the lateral incisions are actually given here that is one thing now second one is if there is going to be a complication that is if it is going to left untreated thinking that it is going to resolve on its own okay then what happens is it leads to necrosis of the distal phalanx why because the four fifth digital arteries passing through this space naturally it will cut the blood supply so these branches to the distal four fifth cannot reach the blood supply will be interrupted and naturally what happens the distal phalanx undergoes necrosis so better that is why what happens is if the pus is not uh, resolving the pain is not resolving the naturally the surgical incision is given at these points which is shown here Now this lateral side is for the infection of the 
synovial sheath of the digits. You know, synovitis of synovial sheath gets inflected, then naturally they can be drained through here. And this is also drainage uh, for one more thing, we will come to it later. Now, the cases of surgical drainage of these spaces nowadays, if you look in an outpatient department or clinic, it is becoming less and less common. Why? Because it is due to the use of antibiotics. So, usually what happens is there are very advanced antibiotics. So, latest antibiotics, what happens is when we ad administer antibiotics or prescribe antibiotics, naturally what happens is it results on its own and there is no need mainly for the drainage of the uh, pus. Only when if it is not healing for a very long time, if it is not resolving or if the patient comes at a later stage, very later stage where pus and abscess has been formed, then naturally we go for surgical drainage of these space. There are also some other spaces on the dorsum of the hand, mainly two spaces you will be able to see what is the dorsal subcutaneous space, another one is the dorsal sub apoderotic space. So, the dorsal subcutaneous space is present between the skin and superficial fascia of the dorsum of the hand. Mainly you see the veins, subcutaneous veins, dorsal venous arch and digital nerves, cutaneous nerves, the branches of radial and the ulnar nerves are present in these space, dorsal subcutaneous space. The next space, what you see here is the dorsal subaponeurotic space. So that is the dorsal subaponeurotic space between the deep fascia and the metacarpal bones. So between the metacarpal bones and the deep fascia, this space is actually called as the dorsal subaponeurotic space. Okay, between the metacarpals, you have it is actually bordered by the dorsal surface of the intrashe, the dorsal intrashe muscle posterior surface. The contents will be resistance or tendons of hands and their expansions, dorsal digital expansion, the venous arch, dorsal carpal arch and metacarpal branches, arterial dorsal metacarpal arteries you can see. So the contents of dorsal subaponeurotic space which is at a slightly deeper plane than the dorsal subcutaneous space. It is present between the deep fascia and the dorsal surface of the metacarpal bones and the dorsal intrachiae. The contents are the extensor tendons, the dorsal digital expansion, dorsal venous network and the digital arteries. That is the dorsal metacarpal arteries, not the digital arteries. The dorsal metacarpal arteries. You can be seen in the dorsal subaponeurotic space. So there are also some other spaces. In the forearm, we have two spaces. One is called as the forearm space of Parona. So, this is actually the site of forearm space of Parona. Now, here some arrows are shown here. If you look at these arrows, this is because the spread of infections from this side to this side. Now, how actually it spreads? It can spread from the radial bursa and the ulnar bursa. So, I will come to it. The next is actually the radial and the ulnar bursa. Okay. So, any wound or puncture wound, any infections from here actually can travel here to the forearm space and from there it may track to the little finger. So, potential space deep to the flexor tendons but in front of the flexor digitorum profundus and flexor pollicis longus is present anteriorly. Posteriorly what you see is the pronata quadratus and the interosseous membrane. So, the synovial sheath extends into the space. Okay. So, here you are able to see here. So, in the front you see the long flexor tendons, deep to the long flexor tendons, but in front of the intrauscious membrane and the pronata quadratus muscle, you have a space between these flexor tendons and the intrauscious membrane and pronata quadratus. 
that is called as the foramen space of the parvona. Now the synovial sheets, what happens is extends, the proximal part of synovial sheet extends into this space. So here you are able to see the forearm space of parvona. So you are able to see the synovial sheet, this synovial sheet might extend into this foramen space of parvona. Now here I able to see any infection from here can track down from here to the little finger because of this communication of this common synovial sheet. Okay. Now four hour space of corona which is shown in your purple color which is seen here, infections from this synovial sheet can point here also, can extend proximally into the four hour space of corona. Now, because of that, what happens is if you want to drain this infected space, then along the lateral border of the forearm, you can give an incision and it can be drained. Okay, so along the lateral borders or along the lateral or medial border of the forearm, the forearm space of corona infected can be drained surgically. Okay, so that is the forearm space, and here this is your tina space, central palmar space. Continuing with the lumbrical canals, you are able to see here. So, this is actually the synovial sheet which is present in the fibrous plexar sheets, you are able to see here. And you can see distally the fibrous plexar sheet does not extend. This is the space of the pulp space and it is a closed space. There is no communication with this and the fibrous plexar sheet. Inside this fibrous plexar sheet, what you have is the tendon which is lined by the old synovial sheet. They might extend up to these spaces. So naturally what happens is infections from here can track to the central palmar space or the thenar space. The next forearm space is the radial bursa, so which you are able to see here. So it is the synovial sheet of flexor pollicis longus extending into the synovial sheet of the thumb. It is continuous. So extending to the top, this one, so flexor policy is planning separate synovial sheet, even though it is passing through the carpal tunnel. You have a separate synovial sheet and it is continuing the synovial sheet of the thumb, which is actually called as the radial bursa. You are able to see the ulnar bursa is a common synovial sheet. It is a double layered sheet you will see here. It has got a parietal layer, it has got a visceral layer. So in between the tendons, it also projects as a bilabular fold like a rhesus. Okay. It is the common sheet for the flexor digitorum superficialis that is how it is arranged. Four tendons not actually all in a line straight transversely to above and actually to below. Then you see the tendons of flexor digitorum profundus. They are all covered by a common synovial sheet. If you look at the synovial sheet covering they end here blindly, but they are not continuous with the synovial sheets of the digits. So there is a space where the tendons are exposed. Whereas it is only continuous with the synovial sheet of the little finger. Okay. So this common synovial sheet for superficialis and profundus is continuous with the synovial sheet of the little finger, but not to the second, third or fourth. So that is why I told you any infections from here through the forearm space it can enter or it might also communicate to this and part up to the little field. Okay. So with that we have actually discussed about the facial spaces and now you know why the spatial spaces of the palm, central palm R space, thenar space and hypothenar space. Then how they are continuous with the lumbrical canals then the outer space of the fingers, then we have seen about the forearm space of corona, then we have discussed about the radial bursa and ulnar bursa, so how they are continuous, ulnar bursa is continuous with the synovial sheath of the little finger only, whereas they are not continuous, they are not continuous with the synovial sheath of digits of the second, third and fourth. So tendons near the digits. Their synovial sheet is not continuous with the ulnar bursa. Whereas the radial bursa, which is of the flexor pollicis longus, is continuous with the synovial sheet of the thumb. Now, 
we are coming to the venous drainage of the lower limb. A short uh, description of venous drainage of the lower limb. So basically, if you look at the veins of the sorry veins of the upper limb, uh, I, I mistakenly told us lower limb. So of the upper limb, it is by two sets of veins. One is the superficial and the deep set of veins. Now. The deep veins, they actually go as venae comitans. So you are able to see two veins here, you are able to see two veins here, similarly you see two veins. So venae comitans of the radial artery, venae comitans of the ulnar artery, venae comitans of the brachial artery. All these deep veins, they are all venae comitans, which means they run on either side of the artery. So why actually they run as venae comitans is because. Since they are present on either side of the artery, the pulsations of the artery aids in the effective venous return because the venous return is against the gravity, it has to be pumped upwards. So, naturally, and you know very well, veins lack effective wall, muscle wall is not very muscular, the tunica media, there is no smooth muscle, very scanty smooth muscle is seen. So that is why they are present in the form of venae comitants, brachial, ulnar and radial veins. And one exception is the axillary vein, which is not present in the form of venae comitants. Instead, it is present as a single vein. So, looking at the axillary vein, which you are able to see here, it is a continuation or the upward continuation of the basilic vein from the lower border of the major to the outer border of the first rib. The same thing for axillary artery the extent. Only thing we have told that in reverse fashion. There we have told extent from outer border of first rib to the lower border of teres major. Here we are actually telling it in the reverse from the lower border of teres major to the upper border of the outer border of the first rib. And beyond that what happens is it continues as the subclavian vein. It is present medial to the axillary artery and it is not covered by axillary sheath of fascia. It is outside the axillary sheath. Now again, if it is bounded within the axillary sheath, there might be impedance or hindrance or interference with the effective venous drainage. The vein might get compressed. So that is why it is outside the axillary sheath. Now before it is continuing a cephalic way, it receives the Sorry, before continuing as the subclavian vein, it receives the cephalic vein. Okay. So, from the lateral side of the arm, the cephalic vein, after piercing the clavipectoral fascia, traveling to the delta pectoral groove, it places the clavipectoral fascia, it opens into the axillary vein. After that, the axillary vein continues as subclavian vein. Okay. So, Coming to the superficial veins, other deep veins, we are not going to discuss about the brachial vein or radial and ulnar veins because they have the same course as the artery. Now coming to the dorsal venous network, from here only the superficial veins they start. So here we are able to see the dorsal venous arch. They are formed by the union of digital veins. So you are able to see proper digital veins from the medial and lateral side of each fingers, mainly the second, third fourth and fifth figures, proper digital veins, they unite to form the dorsal venous network. Now, this network, what happens is joined laterally by the dorsal digital vein of the thumb and lateral side of index finger. So, veins from both the sides of the thumb and lateral side of index finger joins with the lateral side of the dorsal venous network to form the cephalic vein. Okay. Medial side of the network joined by the proper digital vein from the medial side of little finger. So, from the medial side of the little finger, proper digital vein joins, and from the dorsal venous network, after this joining, then it continues as the basilic vein. Okay. So, one is actually the cephalic vein, which is formed by the lateral side of the dorsal venous network. From the lateral side, after joining the proper digital veins from the thumb and the lateral side of index vein. Basilic vein from the medial side of the network, 
after joining proper digital way for the allah side of the little finger okay so i go to the formation that from there what happens it is going to cause your anatomical snuff box over the roof not on the content of floor the roof of the anatomical snuff box is traversed by the cephalic vein then further goes you are able to see it in the forearm so it is superficial structure and in front of the elbow it is going to communicate with the basilic vein through the median cubital vein okay then it travels along the lateral border of forceps then along the deltoid pectoral group pierces the clavicular pectoral fascia and joins the axillary so mainly it is concerned with the lateral border of the forearm and lateral border of the arm it is a superficial vein the next vein is here basilic vein starts on the medial end of the dorsal venous network then to some extent near its commencement it is seen on the dorsal side of the hand then the dorsal aspect of the medial side of the forearm okay on the back of medial side of the forearm you can see it is ascending and then just below the elbow it turns to enter the front of the forearm turns to enter the front of the forearm and again in the region of elbow it communicates to the median cubital vein then at the medial border of biceps it receives the venae cavitans of brachial artery and continues as the axillary vein okay so basically it vein continues as the axillary vein after receiving the venae cavitans from the brachial artery along the medial border of forceps uh, biceps okay the next superficial vein very important vein is the median cubital vein so here you are able to see the median cubital vein connecting the cephalic vein and the basilic vein okay so connecting the basilic and the cephalic vein sometimes it also receives here in the center the median vein of forearm same way there is also an artery which is also called as the median artery which accompanies and it is also called as the axis artery of forearm so axis artery means for the development of the limb this axis artery serves as the center axis around which the limb develops okay based on this axis only we can tell whether it which is the anterior which is the posterior medial and lateral axis which is the axis artery means it is actually the artery accompanying the median nerve so medial vein sometimes what happens directly in the front comes and ends in the median cubital vein so one of the tributary and occasionally veins are more prone for variations okay a variation gains important only when there is an interference in the function so this is actually the preferred vein for blood sampling so you do vein puncture and withdraw the blood so for the mainly so many diagnostic tests and all those things and if you want to give inject some drugs uh, naturally what happens is this is the most preferred way even for intravenous injection why because first thing it is superficially present not very deep so that you need not uh, uh, worry about damage of any other vital structures then it is present on top of the bicipital aponeurosis so there will only deep the bicipital aponeurosis your brachial artery or median nerve might be present so very remote chance of damaging these structures because the bicipital aponeurosis protects the deeper structures now apart from that since it is a superficial vein it will be connected to the deep vein by a perforator so because of this perforator what happens is the nerves the vein is held in its place and it does not slip away from the needle so easily okay so with the, if you are a bit experienced then you can very easily locate the median cubital vein and with the blood for blood sampling or for intravenous injections so because it is superficial it lies on top of bicipital aponeurosis and has a perforator so that it does not slip away when you are trying to puncture the vein and for these reasons the median cubital vein is the most preferred vein 
for VD function. So today we have seen facial spaces of the palm, pulse space of fingers and forearm spaces, then some spaces on the dorsum of the hand also, then a brief account of the venous drainage of the lower limb. So thank you very much. We will actually meet again in some other lecture.